this talk is about studying change. Is it real or not? And typically we don't think about that. We're just going to study change. And if we see changes in means, we think, oh, there is change, right? But is that real or not? Um, that's what we are going to talk about. And um, the, the formal models that we are going to talk about today uh, are called longitudinal measurement invariance models. So we are going to test whether the change we see, see is really a change in the underlying constructs that we are interested in, or whether there's some measurement bias, whether there's yeah, a lack of measurement invariance in the instruments that we use to assess the latent construct. That's what it's all about in a nutshell. So let's first have a look at some questions that we might have uh, when we are interested in change. Then I'm going to introduce the whole principle of testing for longitudinal measurement uh, invariance to you. We are going to discuss some issues that are still out there when testing for measurement invariance. A lot we know how to do it already, but there are still some methodological issues uh, that people are working on. Uh, and then uh, we'll arrive at some conclusions and uh, I will also suggest some further reading to you and some further practice. And that's what we are going to do in the hour after that. I have prepared an assignment for you in uh, using R, Lavan, the same uh, kind of scripting that we already saw a little bit in the previous presentation. And uh, you will hopefully get some practice on how to uh, run these kinds of models and how to look at the output and draw conclusions about the type of change that we see, is it real or not, so to say. Okay, when studying change, well, uh, what are the kind of questions that we are often interested in, in our field, uh, psychology or, or beyond? Uh, well, again, thinking about longitudinal cohort studies, many of you are involved in such studies. You might be interested in questions about change and development. For example, you would like to know how does child IQ develop across time? Or how does parenting competence change across time as a function of gaining more experience as a parent? How does this parenting competence change across time? And also in randomized controlled trials, we're often interested in change, right? So for example, we want to evaluate the effect of psychotherapy uh, on change in depressive symptoms. We hope it works. It ho we hope it leads to a change, a decrease in depressive symptoms if the therapy works. So we're also interested in change. And another study that I was involved in myself, um, studying fathering, uh, was about the effect of nasal oxytocin administration on father's involvement with their children. So if we give them hormones externally uh, distributed, uh, does that impact the way they parent or the way they are involved with their children? It's also a question about change. Does it make them more involved? So here are some two examples uh, with regard to um, what was found when studying change. This is from our own uh, cohort study, or actually I should say Carlos cohort study that I used to be involved in and Miriam Oosterman's uh, study, the generation squared study uh, and uh, parenting self-efficacy, which I, which I sometimes equate to competence. We can, we can debate about that, but um, here I mean perceived competence, perceived, perceived competence as a parent. So um, this was studied in this uh, cohort, uh, both during pregnancy, so the expectations of uh, a parent's ability to parent, how do they think they uh, will, will do, and um, after giving birth to their child, they were followed longitudinally uh, here, uh, three measurements were uh, taken into account. And what you see in these studies with regard to parenting self-efficacy, that there seems to be an increase across time. Well, we can question, well, is that a real change? Or is it really true that parenting self-efficacy changes across time? Or perhaps because mothers become a parent and they gain experience as a parent, maybe the, the, the way they interpret the questions assessing parenting self-efficacy might change. And then there's a measurement difference rather than a true difference in parenting self-efficacy. So the means cannot be directly compared. So that's the question we are going to ask today. And we are going to see which models can we use to address that question. And also in the context of randomized controlled trials, you have, uh, you have also this interest in change. So for example, this is a quite an old study where they looked at um, 
uh, a random, it was a randomized controlled trial um, the, comparing different uh, psychotherapy groups and also control groups group and uh, looking at change in depressive symptoms before the therapy and after, so pre-test and post-test measurement. And in this study, there are many studies out there studying uh, the effect of psychotherapy on depression, but this is one of them that I uh, highlighted. They found indeed a decrease in depressive symptoms, but a similar decrease across all groups. So also in the control condition, they saw this decrease in depressive symptoms. So it could not be attributed to uh, the psychotherapy. But they did observe a decrease. And again, we can ask ourselves, is this a true decrease? Did these people really become less depressed? Or perhaps because they did therapy, they uh, maybe it was a group session, maybe they uh, discussed about their depression, they became more aware of symptoms, or they uh, started comparing themselves to other people with depression. And they thought, well, I have this, it's not that bad, maybe I, I'm not that depressed, and the other person is much more depressed. So this might change the way you uh, think about depression and also answer the questionnaires uh, that assess depressive symptoms. So is it a real change that we observe here? Or or is there a change in, uh, in measurement? So with regard to measurement, well, you can sometimes directly observe behaviors and sometimes that's not the case. And in fact, for many of the things we study, psychological attributes, psychological variables like depression or like parenting self-efficacy, that's something that's, yeah, that's in your head. You could say you cannot directly see how... Uh, what is the level of parenting self-efficacy uh, when you see a parent? And it's also not directly visible when I just look at you. Well, what is your level of depressive symptoms? I, there's no way of knowing this. So I cannot directly observe the uh, constructs that I'm interested in. So psychological constructs, they tend to be difficult to observe and also complex in nature. So what we need is a measurement model for that. Um, and typically you will see something like this. This is a confirmatory factor model. Uh, you might be familiar with that. What we kind of assume is that there is a latent construct. It's not directly observable, but it does exist, like the extent to which you uh, are depressed, depressive symptoms, your depressive symptoms level. And we assume that this latent variable has an impact on how I answer questions that are indications of depression. So like, for example, my mood or whether I uh, socially, socially withdraw or whether I often feel guilty or whether I have a loss of appetite this is a somatic symptom of depression. So those uh, are indicators of the latent construct and we can try to measure those um, indicators and link them to something that we cannot directly observe. And this is a way to uh, indirectly try to get a hold on this uh, the level of depressive symptoms of, uh, of the people I'm interested in. So for this, we use <clears throat> um, a measurement scale, an instrument, a questionnaire often, and we need a measurement model to link the indicators, to link what we observe, in this case, the answers to the questions on the questionnaire about depression. We need to link them to the underlying, not directly observable construct, which is depressive symptoms. And we need to think about the psychometric properties of this scale. We want to assess, make sure that these items assess depression and not anxiety or something else. And we also want to do this in a reliable way. We want to know whether the scores that we obtain are reliable or not. So that's basically what psychometrics or measurement, uh, measurement in psychology is dealing with. Well, thinking about such uh, measurement models, there can be shifts in the way you respond to these items, shifts, uh, which is called response shifts. So for example, thinking about depression in the context of a randomized controlled trial, we might have a pretest uh, measurement of depression. We measure the depressive levels beforehand, then we start the therapy, and afterwards we measure the depressive symptoms again with the same questionnaire, right? This is how it's typically being done. And then that means that we have this measurement model linking the items, the questions people answer about their mood and feeling guilty, et cetera. We link that to depressive symptoms at the pre-test measurement, but we have the same measurement model at the post-test measurement. And we kind of assume and hope that the same model applies because if it doesn't, if at pre-test these items are indication of depression uh, and at post-test these are indications of anxiety, 
then we are comparing apples with pears, right? So then something goes wrong. And it is an extreme case, of course, but this is basically the idea. So um, what could happen when there is a response shift is there's a change in the frame of reference. So the way you think about the question that you need to answer and the way you answer the question, there might be a shift in that, uh, comparing a pretest and a post-test measurement. And this can be the result of the intervention, uh, or it can just be a result of changes across development, thinking about parenting, the way you, um, you answer questions about parenting might change as you gain more experience as a parent, maybe met with success experiences or failure experiences, and also maybe your child uh, grows older, so new demands are asked uh, from you as a parent. It, 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 it makes difference whether you're raising a baby and when you're raising a toddler, uh, you have new uh, challenges probably, so this might um, change your frame of reference and it might impact the way you answer uh, the questions uh, that try to assess parenting self-efficacy. Although maybe your parenting self-efficacy by itself didn't change. That could be the case. That the true levels remain the same, but the way you answer the questions has changed. And that would suggest a change in parenting self-efficacy, while in reality there's no such change. And that's something we want to tease out. We want to get to know. So uh, longitudinal measurement invariance models are models that try to investigate that. So is there indeed a change in the frame of reference, uh, so to say? So think about a single item uh, that is an indicator of depression, feeling guilty. This is from the Beck's depression in inventory. So it is a real item to assess uh, depression. It's being used in research. It has four uh, answer categories. Um, I don't feel particularly guilty. I feel guilty a good part of the time. I feel quite guilty most of the time, or I feel guilty all of the time. And what we try to do is link that uh, indicator to the latent construct, the depressive symptoms. And you can imagine that at pretest, well, maybe um, you have a high level of depressive symptoms. And uh, when you are confronted with that question, you're very likely to answer three. I feel guilty all the time. I feel really bad. I feel guilty all the time. I have these guilty thoughts just all the time. So you cross the three, right? So the level of depressive symptoms, your true score of depression impacts how you answer that question about feeling guilty. And what we uh, typically say that there is some threshold. So when you are scoring beyond a particular threshold on your level of depressive symptoms, so you score really high beyond this threshold, the blue line, then we say, well, then you will answer uh, uh, with response option three. You will say, I feel guilty all of the time. And if you feel less depressed, you will answer maybe a zero, a one, or a two. Now, suppose that this is the situation at pretest. You have a quite a high level of depressive symptoms, and you cross the three. You say, yeah, I feel guilty all of the time. But then you entered into psychotherapy. This was a group therapy. Maybe there was a psychoeducation component about depression. So what you learned about depression and yourself has changed as a result of the therapy. And also maybe you were able to compare yourself to others. And you noticed, well, yeah, I feel depressed, but uh, not, not that depressed. Not that I feel guilty as, as others. So at post-test, you are confronted with this question again, and maybe your frame of reference has shifted, has changed, and now suddenly, given this same level of depressive symptoms, suppose that it, your level of depression hasn't changed in reality. The truth score remained the same. But because of this shift in frame of reference, even though you score high on the latent level, on the true level, you might now uh, be less inclined to cross the three. You say, yeah, well, I feel guilty most of the time, not all of the time, right? So in what we observe with regard to this item, and it could also happen to other items of the questionnaire, is that it suggests a change. It suggests that the depressive uh, symptoms have decreased because first you felt guilty all of the time, and at, after the therapy, you felt guilty most of the time. So this, if we would use this for some score of depression, it would suggest a decrease in, uh, in symptoms, right? But in reality, the depressive symptoms have remained the same. And it's just that you, try, you started to answer, to interpret this item in a different way because your frame of reference has changed. That is the issue of measurement uh, variance. And if that happens, 
you would erroneously conclude that depressive symptoms have decreased while in reality they remain the same. So you draw an incorrect conclusion about the effect of psychotherapy on depression. And that's something you, of course, don't want. So that's the issue of longitudinal measurement invariance, to be able to compare means across time and to talk about real change. If we see differences in means, we want to first establish that we measure the same underlying constructs, that our measurement instrument is measurement invariant across time. So we want to establish longitudinal measurement invariance. Now let's have a look at how this all works. How do we test for longitudinal measurement variance? And there we start with the modeling again. I used colors this time to help you out a little bit. I hope this helps and it's visible. So this is the confirmatory factor model that I already just talked about. This is the measurement model linking the observed behaviors, typically items on a, on a questionnaire, with what we are truly interested in, our psychological construct, which is uh, our latent variable. So we have observed variables, typically items in blue, we use squares for that to say that this is what we observed. And we hope we can link it to this latent variable, our psychological construct of interest, which we denote with a circle. I now made it green. And we also call it, instead of a latent variable, a factor. So with the abbreviation of F stands for factor and V stands for variable. So in this example, we have four items that we think are good indications of some underlying latent variable. Well, then we see other circles in purple. Those are the residuals again, residual factors, we can call them. So those are uh, capture, they, those uh, factors capture everything that we didn't directly observe because we didn't measure it that is unrelated to our latent variable. So it's not depression, but there may be other influences that impact how I answer the question about feeling guilty, for example. Can be just measurement in error. Maybe I'm just not uh, keeping my attention where I'm filling in the questionnaire. It leads to some error in, in the answers, but it can also be other uh, influences uh, like age, or maybe I also measure a little bit of anxiety symptoms in there that is all captured by those residual factors. So all variants in the observed variables that are not attributable to the latent constructs that I'm interested in, but represent something else. Then when we, so these are the variables, latent and observed. And now we also have all kinds of paths with either numbers or stars uh, already connected to them. Um, let's first have a look at the black lines over here. Those are called factor loadings. So those link the latent variable with the observed variables. So, and the direction goes from the latent variable to because we assume that our underlying depression levels, our symptoms of depression, that impact, that causally influence how I respond to this guilty item, right? Um, and we can look at how strongly the uh, observed variables are related to the latent variable. Is gu feeling guilty really a strong indicator, strongly connected to depression? Or is it weakly connected because it's not really a good indication of how depressed I feel. That's something you can infer from looking at the factor loadings. And then with regard to the residual factors, we can estimate, there they are again, residual variances. So how much error variance is there? How much variance is there left unexplained when we look at the variance of each of the items? And we also have the mean model. We have also have intercepts. They are typically denoted by uh, triangles. Um, and we can estimate intercepts for each item. This is um, very briefly the confirmatory factor model. And that forms the basis of everything we do when we test for uh, measurement invariance. Oh, and we have the factor mean as well. We can also estimate the factor mean and also its variance. I will come back to that. I don't want to get into too much detail, but maybe some of you will ask anyway, <laughs> then we'll see. Otherwise, I won't bother you with that. So we can uh, look at the regression equation, basically. And now the variables are not centered yet, so we have intercepts. Um, I used a slightly different notation, just an intuitive notation, not a formal one with, with Greek letters. So, for example, variable one, the response on item one is a function of the intercept of item one. 
um, plus the vector loading times the score on the latent variable on the vector. So someone's true depressive uh, symptoms score plus some error term, some residual term. And we have the same for the responses of all individuals on the other items in the model, items two to four. Well, we can translate these regression equations into expected variances and covariances. So what does this model imply in terms of how the variables are correlated with each other and what the, variance, what the variances are, how we can explain the variances uh, of these observed variables. So for example, the variance of uh, variable one, the variance in that particular item, it can be the guilty item, um, is influenced by the factor loading. So the strength, how strongly um, this item is related to the latent variable times the variance of factor one, which is one in this uh, specification times the factor loading again. So it's the factor loading squared that represents the extent to which variance in variable one is explained by variance at the latent depression level, plus variance in the residual factor. So the residual variance. So we decompose the variance of the item into a part that's being explained by depression. That's what we hope that that part is, is large. And there's also some residual variance, external other influences, probably also impacting the responses on this variable. And we have the same type of specification for um, the other three items. And then we can also look at the expected covariances. Well, the covariance or the correlation between item one and item two is, is there. We expect it to be there because both items are indication of depression, right? So this would create um, an association between the items, among the items. And we can formally work that out. So for the covariance between variance one and variance two, the model implies that this is given by the factor loading one times factor loading two in this model. And we also have the expected means, and that is important for now because we want, in, in the end, we want to compare means across time. And we want to know, can we really do that? Or, or is there a measurement problem? So the means model is also important here. In the cross leg panel model, we kind of ignored it. But here we don't, we, it's really important. So the mean on variable one is given is a function of the factor loading of uh, item one times the mean of the factor, which is here uh, constrained to zero, plus the intercept um, belonging to item one. So you are left with the intercept. Keep that in mind. It's a lot of formal stuff. Well, this model, if you test for measurement invariance across groups, you can use a multi-group confirmatory factor analysis. You can say, well, I have my depression questionnaire uh, in men and in women, and I would like to know, do men and women interpret these questions in a similar way? So does this measurement model, is it the same in men versus women? So then you would have this model, this measurement model, both in group one, the men, and also in group two in the women. So this is a multi-group confirmatory factor analysis, and it's typically used for testing measurement invariance across different groups. But now that's not what we want because we don't have different groups. No, we have different time points. And we want to compare this measurement model at pre-test with the measurement model at post-test, right? Or maybe we have even more longitudinal data in our cohort study. We have multiple waves. And we want to know, does this model hold at each wave? Do we measure the same thing at each wave or time point? So then we need a confirmatory factor model for repeated measures. So instead of having them as groups, just two different models, we have them now next to each other. It's visually uh, more attractive to represent time. And uh, we have the measurement model at time point one, and we have the measurement model at time point two. And then rather than having a multi-group uh, confirmatory factor model, we need to specify the dependencies across the repeated measures, so to say, because these variables, depression can be related through depression levels can be related across time, right? The pretest level and the post-test level. 
So we are allow for a correlation between the repeated measures, between the time points for the latent construct. That's the correlation you see really uh, below on the slide. And then in addition, when we look at the residual factors, all the external influences that extend the way we respond to those items, they could also uh, be correlated across time, right? Because if anxiety really also feeds into the way I answer the question, I feel guilty, uh, then this external factor, which is anxiety, feeds in maybe to uh, the items at both time points. So the residual factors are also allowed to be correlated. So that's why for each item, you see that the residual factor can correlate or co-vary with that same item on the other time point. Not across items. We, you could also do that, but that's typically not the way it's being modeled. This is kind of an assumption that all the cross item correlations are being explained by uh, the fact that they belong to the same latent construct and not that residual factors are also correlated. But this is some assumption that you could challenge, you could test. If you have enough degrees of freedom, you can relax that assumption if you want. But typically, this is the way the longitudinal confirmatory factor model is, is modeled. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay, so now let's have a look how we, using this model, how we can test for different levels of longitudinal measurement invariance. Typically, four different levels, they are differ in the stringency with regard to invariance, um, they uh, are, um, are being tested. So the first level of longitudinal measurement invariance that we should test and that we should uh, try out is called the configural invariance model. <laughs> and that simply means thus the same factor model, the same factor structure apply for the different time points. So going back to this model here, we assume that all four items are reflective of the same single underlying latent variable. So there's one depression construct that all four items are indications of. But maybe um, it could also be that there are two dimensions underlying these four items. Maybe it's not one unidimensional depression construct, but it is a two-dimensional depression construct consisting <laughs> of um, an, a cognitive component and a more effective component, for example. It could be the case. And uh, the question now is for configural invariance, does the same factor model hold across time? So is it indeed the case that there's one underlying factor at time point one, and it's also one underlying factor at time point two? It doesn't change to from unidimensional to two-dimensional suddenly, for example. If that would be the case, then the same factor model doesn't apply. It doesn't hold. So configural invariance is already uh, violated. It doesn't hold. So this is the first thing you want to establish, that the same factor model, for example, a one-factor model, holds for all time points. Then the second step would uh, already impose some additional constraints to this model. It's called metric invariance. And here we ask ourselves the questions, well, do the factor scores predict the responses on the observed variables equally well across time? In other words, is the strength of the relationship um, indicated by the factor loadings? Is the strength of the relationship connecting the items to the latent variable? Is that this of the same strength at each time point? So for example, thinking about the guiltiness item, um, if this is violated, then for example, guiltiness is a very strong indicator of depression at time point one. But at time point two, after following the therapy, maybe they have learned that guilt, feeling guilty is really not so much associated with depression. And suddenly the strength of that item to depression is really weakened. If that happens, we see different magnitudes of the factor loadings linking the items to the latent variable. And then metric invariance would also be violated. Then the way the, in, the items are indicators of depression has shifted. So that's metric invariance. A third step is called scalar invariance, sometimes also called strong invariance. And uh, here we ask ourselves the question, is any difference in response mean the result solely of differences in factor means? 
we can go back to the equations. We won't do that for now, but then you can see it. I think I have it on the slides later on somewhere. In addition to constraining vector loadings to be equal across the time points, what we already did when we tested for metric invariance, we now also constrain the intercepts. And that, if that holds, this implies that any difference you see in the means on the items are the result of differences on the latent variable level, differences in vector means. Because the strength connecting the item with the vector is the same, the mean can be different, of course, and the intercept is also the same. So in terms of the expected means, any differences in means across the time points can only be the result of differences in factor means. This is what you want, right? Because then we can say, if we see differences on the item level, on the observed level, then we can compare those means because then we have established that we uh, are really looking at means at the latent level. These differences in means represent true differences in depression scores. It's not a result of measurement bias. It's not a result of a differential strength linking the items with the latent variable. And it's also not um, related to differences in intercept. So how quickly you are going to answer a yes to this question or a three to this guiltiness question. It's unrelated to that because the intercept would be the same and the factor loadings would be the same. So any differences in item means between time points should then be the result of differences in factor means. We're going to see that later on uh, in the models. And then the most stringent uh, type of invariance is called strict invariance, also called full invariance. And then we ask ourselves the questions, are differences in observed scores across time only due to true differences on the construct and not to any difference in measurement of the construct. So something that we didn't constrain yet in the strong invariance model, but what we are going to constrain in this step is constrain also the residual variance. So the amount of external influence, the amount of measurement error or other influences impacting this, the answers on this item should also be the same across time points. So this is an additional uh, constraint. And if that holds, then we have full measurement uh, invariance. Then the measurement model is the same in terms of how the model is specified, configural invariance, but then also all the parameters that we estimate in the model are of the same size, the same value between the time points. Then we have reached strict invariance. So to visualize this, the configural invariance model would look like this. We have the same factor model, a one factor model in this case, but it does exactly the same pathways for time point one and time point two, right? We have seen that already. The metric invariance model would impose the first set of constraints, and I highlighted them here. You see now that instead of having stars, and stars stand for we estimate them freely, they can take on any value based on the data. We are asked uh, Arlavan uh, to estimate these parameters and they can turn out differently, the factor loading uh, for a variable uh, two uh, for time one versus time two. But here we say if metric invariance holds, then the factor loadings, they have the same size. So FL1 connecting variable two to factor one, at time point one, it's, it should have the same value as the fa that factor loading on time point two. The same for the factor loadings of item three and item four. Yeah. Is there the mic somewhere? Because uh, you say all the time, if it holds, does that mean that the model fits? Yes, I'm going to talk about model fit later. Yeah, on. I thought it so, indeed yeah. means that model fits well. Okay. If you impose constraints, the model will model fit will can only get worse. Okay. And what you are going to test is whether the deterioration in model fit, so the, the model fit getting worse, it's non-significant, then you're allowed to make those constraints because it doesn't lead to a worse fit of your model. Okay. I'm going to have a look at that. Yeah. yeah. Good. But that's the basic idea. The scalar invariance model imposes an additional constraint. We already had the factor loadings being constrained to be equal across time points. Now, in addition, we are also to going to constrain the intercepts in our model. So you see, I see two, three, four, 
the intercepts of all the items. We are also going to constrain them to be equal. Well, then we see when we look at the equations for the expected means that we already had on one of the previous slides, by doing that, by constraining the intercepts and the factor loadings, we see that between time points, any difference in the mean of variable two can only be the result uh, of a difference in factor means between time point one and time point two. It cannot be the result of a difference in intercept or a difference in the factor loadings, the way the, the strength uh, with which we can connect the item to the latent variable. It can only be a result of true differences in means on the latent level, so the depression score, the true depression scores. That only impacts whether the means on the two time points are different by constraining the factor loadings and the intercepts. Yes. Um, I just have a question, maybe I missed it. Why is the, the first factor loading a one and the other yes. one is like FL234? This is what I tried to skip for you to not make it too complex, but I knew you were going to ask. Um, that is because you have to kind of scale the latent variable. A latent variable is something that we didn't observe, so it doesn't have a natural scale. If you have an item, you can just compute the mean and the variance. You, it's in the data, right? But this latent variable is something we define ourselves, so it doesn't have a mean and a variance by definition. So you need to estimate it. And there are two ways you need to identify uh, that part of the model. And there are two ways of doing that. And I try to prevent that uh, if you keep giving you that information, but you want to know. So I'm going to tell you, you can do it in two ways. You can either say, well, I'm going to fix the variance of factor one. So you see it in the, the star there, down there. I'm going to fix that to one. That's one option. Then you say, okay, I, the latent variable, what is most easy to handle? I'm going to say the mean of that fact, latent variable is zero and the variance is one. Then I have kind of a standardized uh, normal, uh, standard normal distribution, right? For my latent variable, it's easy. But alternatively, you could also so say, no, I'm going to fix the first factor loading or any other factor loading, but typically the first one is chosen. Fix that factor loading to one. And I'm going to estimate the variance of factor one. And also I can estimate the factor mean. That is more convenient because as we, if we are going to test differences across time points, you might also at some point be interested in differences between the factor means or factor variances or factor covariances. So at the true level, at the underlying level, the true depression scores, we want to know how does the mean depression scores uh, on time point one differ from time point two at this latent level and how are uh, maybe several factors correlated with each other. So that's the reason why in this specification when testing measurement invariance, it's common to um, fix the first factor loading to one but rather than fixing the variance of the factor to one. But they are diff different parameterizations of the same model. In terms of model fits, what we will see later, you will get the same results. And if you standardize all the paths, you will also get the same results. Okay, and then when we look at the strict invariance model, we already had the uh, constraints on the factor loadings and the intercepts. And now, in addition to that, we also say the residual variances of each item are also constrained to be equal across time points. And then we know that differences in observed means across time are only the result of differences in factor means and not any other thing aspect of the measurement model. And in addition to that, differences in observed covariances across time, variances or covariances, are also only the result of differences in factor variances or covariances. So in terms of measurement model, how we link what we have observed to what is latent, everything is the same across time points. So everything we see as different uh, at the observed level should be the result then of something being different at the latent level, which we th say is the true level. So um, then we have reached full longitudinal measurements invariance, strict invariance, longitudinal measurements invariance. 
model fit. Uh, of course, how are we going to evaluate these models? Well, you can lo look at the fit of each model. Does the model fit well to the data? Using standard model fit indices, and there are still also a lot of debates about which ones you should use and which cutoff values you should use. This holds for structural equation modeling in general, but also more specifically to measurement invariance models. Uh, so typically you look at things like the chi-square test, which we know is influenced by sample size and also model complexity, by the way. The uh, root mean square of error approximation, the CFI and the TLI, two other fit indices, are typically chosen, but there are others out there. And there are also uh, variations on these, like the robust CFI. We will see it in the output later on. And uh, it's really difficult to, to say which ones are the best, uh, but these are typically being used. And when it comes down to model comparisons, we want to know whether the uh, constraints that we impose on the models in these different steps, whether they don't lead to uh, a worse fit, whether the, um, yeah, the factor loadings, for example, can be constrained to be equal. Uh, then they should not be too different because that will lead to really worsening of the fits. Then you're not allowed to constrain them, right? So for that, you can look at difference, uh, difference uh, values of these uh, fit indices, like the difference in chi-square, uh, the chi-square difference test, or the difference in the RMECA val uh, value, or CFI, for example. And here on the slide, I've put three references that are nowadays quite commonly used. They sometimes differ in the cutoffs they propose. So these are kind of, this is kind of a summary of this, a rough summary where they say, well, the RMSEA should not change by more than 0 0.03 points and the CFI not more uh, than 0 0.01 points. But there's still a lot of debate about this. OK. Another thing you should know about is the difference between having continuous and categorical indicators. You might have been thinking about this with the guilty guiltiness item already. For categories, this is categorical, right? Many of the items we study in questionnaires consist of a limited number of answer options, like three answer options, maybe four, five, seven is already quite a lot. You could say, well, we could treat that as continuous if it's like seven, but if it's less, that's, that's definitely a problem. And some categories might also uh, not uh, be answered very frequently. So we might have empty cells and stuff like that. So typically, if you can treat your indicators, so your observed variables as continuous, then you are dealing with those four levels of measurement invariance, like we discussed. But if you have categorical indicators, there's an alternative model that you might need to use, which is called a threshold model. And then you can only have test for three levels of measurement invariance. Basically, that's because what we say is, well, we already linked the guiltiness item to the latent variable depression, right? But since guiltiness is actually a categorical item consisting of four answer options, you should say, well, we should put something in between. In fact, people can only answer zero, one, two, or three, right? Feeling not guilty or all the, all the time guilty. Those are the four options that people are given. But you could think of a latent variable underlying that item that represents some kind of continuous scale of how guilty people feel. And you could, uh, that is the threshold model. You could say, well, there's also this normal distribution, this continuous distribution uh, for guiltiness. And as soon as people score very high above a certain threshold on this latent guiltiness variable, then they will cross the three if they pass or are beyond that threshold. If they are below that threshold and they are in, just a bit lower, they might cross a two or a one or a zero. And the same applies like you asked with the, um, I think you asked about the, the, um, the scaling of the factor. Here we also have another latent variable for guiltiness and we have the same problem. We should give it a scale because the scale is arbitrary. So typically what we say, well, we assume a standard normal distribution for that latent variable. We say it has a mean of zero and a variance of one. But that implies that um, we cannot, that the, the variance is fixed already. So we cannot at any time estimate, well, intercepts or thresholds in this case, it becomes a bit complex, 
and the variances at the same time. So testing both intercepts and residual variances in two separate steps is no longer possible. That's kind of the take home message. So when you're dealing with categorical indicators, you might want to run a threshold model and you uh, can only test for three different levels uh, depending on the parameterization it is called of, of your model. Just as a side note, so you are aware of this, you might encounter it in articles and also in press when you are going to test for measurement invariance yourself. Annelena. Uh, and can you do this also with dichotomous uh, variables? Yes, you can also do this with dichotomous uh, variables. So then you would only have one threshold. You yeah. see here three blue lines. And it kind of separates the, the latent distribution into four categories. Mm -hmm. So once you pass the first threshold, you will answer one on this questionnaire. If you pass the second threshold, you will answer two. If you pass the third threshold, you will pass, you will answer three. So with four answer categories, you have three thresholds to be estimated if you fix the, the scale of the latent variable. Um, and um, if you have a dichotomous variable, you will only have one threshold. Okay, but you still need to fix the distribution, like saying it's it's standard normal, for example. Okay, let's have a look at an application. Um, it's time for that. This is something we also worked on uh, within the Generation Squared study, not the growing up in Ireland study, but uh, in collaboration with the VU. Uh, and this was about parenting self-efficacy, so the perceived ability, uh, perceived competence um, of a parent with regard to its parenting role. It's almost to be submitted. The goal was that it was submitted before I, I was here, but we didn't uh, manage. But we are in a far stage with this paper. And we really wanted to know, uh, well, this, this observed increase in parenting self fixie that we see in the data, is this true? Is this a true change? Or is there also some measurement bias? Because you can imagine that when you're pregnant still and you didn't give birth and you don't have the actual experience of being a parent, that your expectations about how you will parent are different than when you actually have your child and you, you start to parent. So maybe the whole construct of parenting self-efficacy is really not the same construct when you talk about this in the prenatal phase versus the postnatal phase after giving birth to your child. So we wanted to know this. So generally, more generally, we are interested in the question, how does parenting self-efficacy develop in the transition to parenthood? And we want to, more specifically in this, in this paper, want to know, do changes in mean parenting self-efficacy represent changes in the true underlying score, so the true levels of parenting self-efficacy? And do we measure the same underlying parenting self-efficacy construct when we compare prenatal time points with postnatal time points? That was something we wanted to establish. But also, across postnatal time points, does the experience of being a parent in the first two years of parenthood affect how mothers answers this scale to assess parenting self-efficacy? Because you can imagine that not only does parenting self-efficacy change when your child uh, grows older, but also maybe the way you answer the questions about parenting self-efficacy. So this is the questionnaire, 16 items, the self-efficacy in the nurturing role uh, scale. The answer categories range from one to seven. So we had quite a lot of answer uh, options and we treated them as continuous, which can be debated. But if you don't, you get a lot of uh, low frequency uh, categories and you also enter into computational problems. So we said seven typically is being enough to say, well, let's treat it as continuous. Um, the questionnaire already has different wordings um, for the prenatal version and the postnatal version, this is the, these are the postnatal items. For example, I feel confident in my role as a parent. Prenatally, this is, I expect to be, to feel confident in my role as a parent. So it already has, thing. this can of course already affect uh, different answers to these uh, types of questions. And in the toddler version, we changed all references to a baby to my child. Instead of my baby, we said my child because baby doesn't, does no longer apply. So some minor changes were also um, made for the toddler version. Well, now we can have, think about these models. Think about, we have six time points, three prenatal time points, three postnatal time points, two in the first year and one uh, after two years. 
16 items, six time points. I try to make a graph, but of course this is really, this becomes so big and ugly. Imagine the script is <laughs> also really big and ugly. So I kind of summarized the four steps of measurement invariance by saying, well, we have item one up to item 16 with the dots to not, I didn't depict them all. And we have, in this case, we found two latent variables. We found the parenting self-efficacy um, questionnaire to be two-dimensional. It consists of two latent variables that were correlated, so sub-dimensions, so to say. But you see that in step one, we just test whether this same two-factor model holds across all the six time points. I only depicted two time points, but in fact, you can repeat them in your head. There are six of them. Then in the second step, we tested for measurement invariance, uh, where we see in bold the factor loadings being equated uh, to each other across all the six time points. In step three, the scalar invariance model, in addition to constraining the factor loadings, we also constrain the intercepts. You, you, so you see the pathways from the triangle to the um, items. And in the last step, we also constrained the residual variances. You see them now on the bottom of the graph. You see the arrows pointing to the double-headed arrows uh, connecting, pointing to, to the items, to, to themselves. So that, those represent the variance of the residuals. Kind of depicted in a slightly different way because it's more compact to draw it. <laughs> Okay, so what did we find? We found two dimensions consistently for all the six time points. It was already interesting by itself to see, well, apparently the, the parenting self-efficacy questionnaire that we used, nobody had looked at dimensionality, but apparently it's not unidimensional, but it consists of two dimensions. Here you see the results and we try to make sense out of these two dimensions. And we think the first dimension uh, represents something like confidence in, uh, in parenting skills, more of a cognitive evaluation of appraisal uh, about uh, one's ability to parent. And the second uh, dimension get, um, yeah, is, is more effectively laden. It is more about feeling distressed or getting uptight uh, or uh, being insecure or having concerns. So it seems to be slightly uh, yeah, more related to experiencing stress and uh, yeah, emotional, um, emotionally laden items. What we think, but this of course is also can be debated. Uh, there can be discussion about it. But these two dimensions were really consistency found for the three prenatal time points and the three postnatal time points. The only exception was that one item at, in the toddler version, so the sixth time point, didn't load very nicely on one of the factors. That's so the only difference. But for, we thought this is really acceptable. This is really, uh, you know, a, a, quite a robust result. So we were happy with that. So configural invariance was established, a two-factor model for all the time points, the same two-factor model, linking the same sets of items to the same uh, two factors. Well, this is the paper, the table from our paper to be submitted. You see that it gets really long and complex, uh, but I will uh, walk you through it. This, this contains all the model fit results. You see like values like RMSEA and CFI, these model fit statistics. And we first compared the three prenatal time points and we established strict invariance. So the model fits uh, criteria are still uh, good to acceptable. And also when we compare different model fit indices with each other, um, the fit was not significantly worsening. It was still acceptable. Well, then we looked at the three postnatal um, time points and we did not get any further than metric invariance, unfortunately. So we did see some measurement differences in uh, intercepts and residual variances. Factor loadings could be constrained to be equal across those three time points, but we couldn't, couldn't go further. And uh, you see uh, particularly the CFI value dropping quite a bit and it's no longer acceptable, uh, the fit in the scalar invariance model. It drops from 0 0.906 to 0 0.843, and that's uh, too large of a drop. And uh, we also compared all the six time points together. Um, and again, we saw a similar result. Um, metric invariance was achieved, but no strict or um, scalar invariance. Yes. 
Have you only accepted packets with you? Have you checked the Wi-Fi files with you? And one uh, uh, overarching factor? Um, no, we didn't test. It's a good question. Did we test a bifactor structure? Uh, we yeah. didn't. Um, we just have the two factor model, but we allowed the two factors to be correlated. So we didn't impose, for example, a higher order uh, factor, but this probably is there uh, because the two factors are correlated. Uh, I hope I might. No, I think I don't have it in this presentation, but it's, it's of course in the paper. Yeah. Was there another question? Yeah. Meanwhile, I'm looking at the time. We are one hour ahead, but that's okay. Uh, here you have the, have the changes in the model fit, but if already some of the model fit values is not acceptable, do you then yeah. still need to look at the changes or? That's an open question. Do we only look at each model and the model fits should be good to acceptable according to those criteria. So for example, we say a CFI uh, acceptable fits, it should be above 0.90, it's a common cutoff. And for good fit, it should be above 0.95. So do we say we, we don't go below the 0.90 for the CFI? Mm. Um, that could provide you with slightly different information compared to looking at the difference mm. uh, values. And nobody knows. Um, <laughs> this can happen, of course. It could be that you have great fits. You start out with uh, 0.99 for CFI, but it drops more than 0 0.01 uh, points. It drops from 0.99 to 0.95. It's still good fits, but the drop is, is not acceptable. Then you have to think, I think you need to carefully examine uh, if that's, for example, from going from configural invariance to metric invariance. What I would do is looking at the factor loadings themselves, look at, okay, how, how large are the differences? What is my sample size? How complex is my model? All kinds of issues that might impact this finding, but I would be generally be inclined to say that it's still good. I mean, there is a large drop in CFI, but the fit is still good, even not acceptable. So it's still 0.95, right? And we are we'll be very happy for most of the factor models that we test to have such good fit indices. But that's up to the researcher to decide. Here it's kind of consistent. When there is a drop below the acceptable level, there's also a too large drop. It's in, in this case, it's, it's consistent, so which is convenient, but it's not always the case indeed. It can also be that the drop is minor, but you just go below the threshold. You go from 0.905 to 0.898 or something. Then that's allowed, but you are no longer have acceptable fit. This can happen. It's up to you to, to make up your mind. Well, going just below the 0.90 threshold, is this still okay? And then you also have the different fit indices that might give you different results. So it's really not a clear cut thing where it's just either yes or no. No, it's really you have to carefully examine those fit indices, make up your mind, and also have a look at the uh, parameter estimates. Sensible uh, model in the end that still has good enough fit, in your opinion. OK, so what we concluded is that the parenting self-efficacy means can be meaningfully compared during pregnancy across the three time points but not entirely during infancy and toddlerhood. Um, the, the PSE means that we observe they, postnatally, they represent a combination of true changing scores, but also some change in uh, the way the, uh, the mothers respond to the questionnaire. And this is, I think, interesting by itself. Uh, we have been thinking about uh, looking at which items show a lot of invar or lack of invariance, and maybe we can develop an abbreviated scale that contains items that still tap the two dimensions because we think that is important, but that show uh, longitudinal measurement invariance. So taking out the items that perform badly in that regard. However, uh, we also say in the paper that still you, we should not only look at longitudinal measurement uh, invariance, but much broader at the psychometric properties of such an abbreviated scale. So we should still establish things like content validity if we take out the items and also the abbreviated scale should be reliable enough. So there's still a lot of psychometric work to do. <laughs>
Ooh, running out of time again. Um, I will uh, go through this quickly. There are still some issues to be aware of. This is just the basic way of testing longitudinal measurement invariance. Just for you to know that you also know that something like partial measurement invariance assist, exists. You can allow for invariance of certain items in the model and allow for a lack of invariance in other uh, parts of the model. And some people have developed guidelines to say, well, then it's still acceptable to compare the means, although we don't reach full, but only partial measurement invariance. When you have very complex models with a lot of data and probably also combined with categorical data, you might run into computational problems. And one solution is to move to uh, Bayesian uh, testing, Bayesian measurement invariance testing. And another issue that is debated is what if the scale itself has changed? by taking out items that are not appropriate for toddlerhood or by developing new items that have been added to the scale. This is common practice. And then what does that mean for measurement invariance and how should we approach this problem? There's a lot of debate and also some papers about this. Okay, conclude. Parenting competence or parenting self-efficacy, the way we measured it is a two-dimensional. Strict MI uh, holds for the prenatal time points, but not uh, for all the time points. And uh, response shifts have also been studied for the Bex depression inventory uh, in the context of randomized controlled trials by Fokoma et al. And um, she also found evidence for these, this response shift, so for this lack of invariance. So the mean comparisons comparing pre versus post test might be confounded. There might be some measurement bias in there as well. So testing for longitudinal measurement invariance um, can be done if you have multiple indicators of uh, an underlying construct. If uh, measurement invariance doesn't hold, then mean comparisons may be invalid. You're not looking at just quantitative differences uh, on your scale, but also at qualitative differences in what you actually measure. Uh, but some invariance is still allowed, like partial measurement invariance. And I think some side effects uh, of studying longitudinal measurement invariants that, is, that are worthwhile is that it provides really relevant information about what you actually measure by doing these types of analysis. You're going to look at how these items connect to your latent variable and what does it represent. So it really gives you a lot of information also about the content of your questionnaire. And sometimes it can lead to uh, concrete suggestions to improve uh, the measurements. Take home message. Um, always test for longitudinal measurement invariance. That's a good thing to do, it's useful. And after this tutorial, after the next hour, you will know how to do this. Further reading and practice, here are some suggestions for papers, more technical ones also included in case you're interested. I will not go over it. And further practice, we will do it after the break. Uh, we will uh, start using RStudio to have a look how we can actually test for measurement invariance. Thank you all again for paying attention. <laughs> Are there any questions?